Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, offer no resistance to one who is evil. When someone strikes you on your right cheek, turn the other one as well. If anyone wants to go to law with you over your tunic, hand over your cloak as well. Should anyone press you into service for one mile, go for two miles. Give to the one who asks of you and do not turn your back on one who wants to borrow. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your heavenly Father. For he makes his sun rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what recompense will you have? Do not the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brothers only, what is unusual about that? Do not the pagans do the same? So be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. We all have many concerns about what's going on out there in the world. Uh, what sociologists would say often is way beyond our control. It's our big circle of concern. And so there's wisdom, the sociologists say, in focusing what is in your control, your spheres of influence. And so today we can apply that topic to Jesus telling us to consider how we treat our enemies. I don't know about you, but when I first started to reflect on the gospel for this weekend and started to think about my enemies, my mind went back 36 years immediately to a middle school hallway in Pennsylvania. One of my classmates had been taunting me for weeks. I don't know why, I probably did something, but just taunting me for weeks, literally pursuing me down the hallways as he was doing so. And I'm embarrassed to say that one day, I couldn't take it anymore, and I'm embarrassed to say that I turned around and I punched him in the stomach. The taunting stopped, but the trauma was transferred to me. I've regretted it ever since. Some 36 years later, I still don't know what that young man must have been struggling with to be lashing out at me. And in my insecurity, I turn to violence. And in my insecurity, I turn to vengeance, right? Uh, many of us probably think we have at least one enemy. I'm not gonna ask for a raise of hands, but there's a story about a priest who was preaching on this gospel, and he asked his parishioners to raise their hands if you think you have a lot of enemies, if you have some enemies, if you have at least one enemy, and most hands went up. But then the priest noticed an older gentleman in the back of the church who didn't raise his hand, he, said, he actually raised it, didn't, he raised his hand when the priest said, who doesn't have any enemies? And he said, my name is Joe, and I'm 100 years old, and I don't have any enemies. And the priest was so excited, he invited the man up to the front. And he said, what a great Christian life you live. Tell us, how is it that you don't have any enemies? And the man said, all those jerks are dead. We might feel like that. Uh, Jesus tells us that there's a better way to treat our enemies than punching them in the stomach or just trying to outlive them. Right? He says today, but I say to you, love your enemies. He's referring to an ancient law that said, love your fellow countrymen and be wary of those who are outside, the foreigners. And Jesus, in his fullness of love for all humanity, says, love everyone. 
love. Love that person who you got me thinking about already, Deacon Frank, love. Let's acknowledge there's a few different types of love. There's the friendly, um, fraternal love, philios. Uh, we're not talking about that. You don't have to be friends with your enemy. There's the romantic love, eros. Uh, you don't have to fall in love with your enemy, right? You can still have good boundaries between you and your enemy. Jesus is talking about God love. He's talking about agape. It's unconquerable. It's invincible, willing the good for that other person, despite what they might be doing for, to you, right? Wow, that sounds pretty great. How do we, how do, we do that? Right? And again, it has everything to do with locally, how we allow ourselves to talk with God, how we talk to ourselves, how we talk with those immediately around us. It begins with knowing in our heart and soul that we are loved by God, that you are loved by God. Because in that security, in that secure knowledge, we're able to love others as God loves them, see them as he sees them. So how can we know it in our heart and our soul? Let Jesus talk with you. Let Jesus talk with you. Spend time with the scriptures. Find a habit for that. St. Jerome tells us that when we read the Bible, Jesus speaks to us. When we read the Bible, Jesus speaks to us. St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, let the Bible interpret you. Let the Bible reveal to yourself uh, your identity before God as one who is loved. And Jesus is talking with us this weekend in the scriptures. The psalm, Psalm 103, is a believer addressing his own soul because he's knowing the love of God for him. Bless the Lord, O my soul. What's the last time you encouraged your soul to give praise to God? And why is he saying that? Because he's being reminded that God is merciful. God is gracious. God is slow to anger. God is full of kindness. Those are words for each of us to internalize, to let Jesus speak to our heart. Words for each of us to internalize and words for each of us to adopt, right? Because that starts to paint a picture of what it looks like for us to love others, including our enemies. Merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abundance, abundant in kindness. And you might be thinking, wow, I'd love to be known like that. But boy, is it hard. Yeah. Let Jesus keep talking with you in the other scriptures this weekend. St. Paul, talking to the early church in Corinth, is speaking the eternal word of God to us. You are the temple of God. You, individually, are the temple of God. And you, we, as a body, are the temple of God. God's spirit dwells in us. And then did you hear that phrase that should just make all of us say, wow? The word of God is saying, everything belongs to you. Everything belongs to you. And those who comment on these scriptures have said, have reminded us that life in Christ, life in Christ brings us a share of his lordship over all creation. What? Our life in Christ brings us a share in his lordship over all creation. And the commenters say this great phrase, they say, that enables us to walk around with a certain proprietorial feeling as we walk through the world, a share in the ownership that Jesus has as Lord of all creation, including how we treat our enemies. A proprietorial feeling. And doesn't that just set us up to do beautifully what St. Matthew is uh, revealing uh, this weekend? Uh, and what he's basically saying is how to break the cycle of hatred and violence. Breaking the cycle of hatred and violence. Wouldn't you love to be known as that person? Hey, who's that over there? Oh, well, they, um, they're known for breaking cycles of hatred and violence. We could do that with our life in Christ. Right? And I've been thinking a lot about that. And as I'm thinking about how we allow God to talk with us, how we encourage our soul to give praise to God, and then how we have this chance to speak with people most locally, it gives us a big opportunity to break cycles of hatred and violence. And it's a sensitive one. It's a delicate one that I think a lot of people can slip into very easily, accidentally, and it's gossip. 
And so I think a lot of breaking cycles of hatred and violence has to do with what do we do when we encounter a situation where someone is gossiping, when someone is speaking about someone who is absent. And the church has kind of fancy terms to help us understand what's really going on. They use words like calumny and detraction. You've probably heard those words. Calumny is the spreading of falsehoods about someone. Maybe we don't check out something, maybe we just mindlessly repeat it, and we're hurting the reputation of that person who is absent. Detraction, some would say, well, I'm just telling the truth, because detraction is telling the truth about someone, but it's about, it's about telling their faults and sins to people who don't need to know. Calumny and detraction, I'm sure we'd all agree, those tear the fabric of a community apart. And they erode trust like nothing else. And it's the beginning of a fissure in humanity. It's that personal sin that leads to social sin, as John Paul II used to remind us. Right? So what do we do when we experience that? Oh, we punch them in the stomach. No, we don't. What do we do when we encounter someone who is engaging in this and slipping into it? And I think most people do slip into it inadvertently because... I'm going to share some advice that, that I received from others when I accidentally slipped into this in the past. One of the ideas is to create a, um, a culture where you always envision that you're sitting around one big table, and the person who is not physically there, you imagine that they are there around this big table of discussion. What would you say in front of them? Let that guide your heart. But if you're uncomfortable about what's going on, as I've learned, it's good to say something like, you know, if you haven't already, I encourage you to talk directly with that person because it sounds like you guys might have some things to talk about. Right? Or, you know, uh, no disrespect to you, but I, have, I really have no need to know those things you're saying about that person. Uh, and if you find that you're unable to affect a change by speaking um, edifying words, walk away. Walk away. You don't want to get caught up in this hatred and violence. And I call it hatred and violence because it's about stealing the reputation of another. It's about killing the reputation of another person created in the image and likeness of God. This takes courage. It takes courage to love like God loves. So let us ask always, let us ask God always for help in loving our enemies and for help in praying for those who persecute us because through his eyes we could see that they're likely struggling with an insecurity themselves and we could ask for help in finding ways to remind them that they are loved as well let us start each day by letting jesus speak with us in scriptures you know let us find the family bible let us open it up in a prominent place let us invite him to speak to us every day because as we do that, we'll be prompted to remind our souls to bless the Lord. For he is merciful, he is gracious, he is slow to anger, and he is full of kindness.